Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with my big brother, Pastor Morgan. Hey guys. Today, we have a very special guest who serves with Josh McDowell Ministries, a crew ministry, and he is an author, speaker, and director of the Resolution Movement. It's my honor and privilege to welcome Ben Bennett. Ben, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be with you all. Yes, we we had Josh on, so we thought it would be fitting to have you on. We mm-hmm. were able, if anyone missed that episode, you can go back and watch that, but he was just starting to launch the podcast with you, Resolu- Resolution Movement, right? Is mm-hmm. that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Yep. Resolution Movement. And then, um, so we would like you to share really quick who you are and what do you do? <laughs> yes. yes. <and> right <laughs> when he's drinking. He's right trying to show right his sponsors I... <laughs> right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Organic <laughs> seltzer water. Yeah. That is what it is, but definitely not sponsored. I wish. Um, the Resolution Movement. Yeah. So, so Josh McDowell and I teamed up to launch the Resolution Movement. It's a play on words for resolution because mm. it's. Mm. There's so many, so many of us, so many Christians, so many non-Christians are struggling with mental health issues, with yeah. trauma, with hurt, with loneliness, addiction to pornography, and a lot of times the answers we hear aren't all that helpful, oh. or, or can be hard to know what to do about these things. So we said, what if we got together? We launched a movement. We helped resolution people with biblical truth, mm-hmm. brain science, um, research-based principles that that really help them overcome these hurts and struggles, mm-hmm. understand um, better the Christian worldview and, and start to thrive here and now and, and be freed up to, to make a, a difference in this world. So we, we launched that back in May. Mm-hmm. We launched the Resolution Podcast and social media channels, YouTube. We're doing some TikTok now, okay. which, is, which is fun. It's, uh, you never know who's going to watch your video, what they're going to say. <laughs> um, but that it's, it's been a fun ride the past seven, eight months and, and doing some in-person speaking yeah. mm. um, when when that is allowed, when <laughs> when things aren't uh, at the height of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. So. exactly. And we also would like for you to, you know, share your story, your testimony. We heard it on Resolution uh, Movement and it was on YouTube. They can also check it out on, you know, Spotify, iTunes, like all that stuff. But um, we're going to talk about all that later where they can find you and stuff. Not stalk you, but, you know, be able to find <laughs> your resources. But um, the first question with your story is, where were you born? Yeah, I was born in Virginia Beach, Virginia right. in 1989. Oh. So I'm just like a solid millennial. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Um, right there in the middle. Kind of wish I was a Gen Z or. I think I'm right on the know. edge. Uh, 95. So people say that's yeah, right on the edge of uh, Gen Z yeah. and millennial. Yeah. I'm a Gen so Zer. I'm right in between you guys. So we got we got it all covered. We got it all covered. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah, you can flip flop depending on who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. It's like you can go TikTok all day talking to the Gen Zers. You can go MySpace. MySpace. Mm-hmm. Like. I know I feel I feel so out of it like when I know that you work with youth and different things and so when we would go to the schools and try to minister I just felt so out of it because I don't play video games I don't have all Instagram and yeah I don't have all these different things I I've had them at a time I used to play and stuff but I just felt so like not even attached you know and so I was trying to talk with these kids and trying to connect in different ways instead of just you know just telling them hey you you need to do this or that and it was just so hard for me so Mm. maybe we can talk about that later and how to connect because that was kind of my excuse i was Mm -hmm. like oh well i can't connect with these kids so someone else has to do it so maybe later on after your testimony and stuff we can talk about stuff like that write that that down morgan i'll write that down (laughs) yeah Got a pen right here. So you were born in Virginia, and then um, how was it your upbringing? Were you always a Christian? Were your fam- was your family like? Did they go to church growing up? Yeah, um, I grew up going to church e- uh, each week, mm-hmm. and um, we talked about God at home. So early on, around the age of well, in between the ages of four and seven, I had a real understanding mm-hmm. of the message of Jesus. Mm-hmm. 
that God created me, that he loved me, that he wanted a relationship with me, but I had done wrong. You know, at that point, I only kind of knew, like, I disobeyed my parents. Uh, I got angry. You know, I, I did wrong against God. I, I had this pretty profound understanding uh, at an early age. Um, and to be reconciled with God, to have to be forgiven, to have a relationship with God, I understood that um, I couldn't get there on my own. Yeah. I, I couldn't try and be, you know, obey my parents more or, or be a good kid. I needed um, God, Jesus, who lived a perfect life for me, who mm-hmm. died and rose again. I needed that alone to put my faith in that um, and what he did for me. Mm-hmm. So I got that, and it was at a really young age, I had this vibrant understanding of that. And it was awesome because I had this relationship with God. Uh, I would talk to him throughout the day. I would be playing in my room with my cars or GI Joes and I'd be talking to him. And it uh, had this awareness that he loved me and, and was, was there Mm -hmm. for me. So it really was a personal relationship at at an early age. Um, And while that was good, other relationships were broken, particularly mm-hmm. in in my family growing up, uh, and in relationship with my dad. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just remember his experiencing his anger um, at a young age, constantly feeling like I couldn't measure up to his expectations, like I couldn't meet, um, that I, I couldn't follow the rules, and every time. I did something wrong. It was like I experienced his him frowning, his his anger, his disapproval. So I constantly felt on edge, mm-hmm. like, am I going to be accepted? Am I not going to be accepted? And um, that just uh, set the pace for a lot of, of my childhood, feeling alone, feeling like I was the problem, mm-hmm. feeling like I, I couldn't measure up, mm-hmm. like I was loved when I did good and like I was almost hated when I, when I didn't do good. Um, so my inner world at a, at a young age was, uh, very, um, a little challenging. Mm -hmm. I was trying to make sense of it all and, and whatnot. Um, and then around the age of eight, uh, I started to develop anxiety and depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, Mm -hmm. just these different mental health issues. Uh, and, and those were really about, um, survival yeah. for me. I didn't realize that till later in my life early on. I thought it was just like, Oh, I was born this way and it eventually came out, you know, what, and whatnot. But so much research shows that, um, these issues are, are, are developed as ways of surviving, mm-hmm. right? Anxiety often, at least for me was, uh, my body, my fight or flight response saying, okay, when are you going to be harmed? When are you going to be rejected? When are you not going to measure up? Mm -hmm. And then that would, you know, turn on and then I'd start getting anxious. Um, Depression was a way of kind of like self-loathing and turning inward on myself. Eventually when I couldn't fight it anymore, I just gave in and said, yeah, I am what you're saying about me, Mm -hmm. what my friends who are bullying me are saying about me. And I think obsessive compulsive disorder was really a way to, um, when my environment as a kid felt so chaotic mm. as a way to try and control in my mind some aspect of my life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and then uh, of course, um, later in, in my life, um, I got introduced to pornography by some of my friends, started going to public school. And um, that was just one more thing I say is like a, a to, to add into the cocktail of compulsions mm-hmm. to to survive growing up. And for years, I thought that it was like, I thought, man, I'm, I'm just a bad sinner and I can't stop this and making all these promises to God to stop and, and to myself because I, I hated it. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew it was wrong. I had the Holy Spirit. I was convicted. Yet at the same time, it's almost like it kept me alive. Um, there was something about it that caused an escape, uh, a high like a drug. And what I discovered later in my life was nurture. Mm. Um, There's some kind of pseudo nurture and pseudo love that um, I was trying to get in pornography that I wasn't getting elsewhere. And of course, you know, if you do you study what pornography does to the brain, mm-hmm. it 
it impacts it similar to a drug rewires the brain. It's so addictive. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I really needed was an understanding of why am I going to these things? Why am I struggling with these things? Mm -hmm. And what does God want to heal and satisfy in my life that these things aren't, aren't doing? So that was kind of the story early on struggling so much confusion, um, suicidal thoughts mm -hmm. entered in at, at an early age. And it, it was, um, I'm honestly not sure how I made it, made it through. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, of course it was God and yeah. the Holy spirit. Um, but looking back, like life was so much harder then than it is now, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. You ne you never think that, you know, as a 31 year old, all these responsibilities, this job, doing that, that life as an eight or nine year old kid could mm -hmm. be harder. Yeah. Um, but it really was every day was, was like a mental battle and just the obsessive thoughts in my mind. It was truly I exhausting and, um, so, so challenging. Yeah. But, um, it's that, wild that because exactly what you were going through is what a lot more people are going through today you know through the pandemic yeah. and everything is a lot more of those things have happened anxiety pornography all these different things and so you have a you have a better say you know and you can say look how i've come out of that it's not by my strength mm -hmm. but it's by the grace of god and so it's really it's really cool to see that how you struggle with that when you're younger and now you're freed from that and now you can help so many people especially right now during i guess people call it uh what do they say it? rona now but <laughs> in the midst of all this you have so many people to minister to you know Amen. i mean even before that but yeah. it's ramping up even oh, more yeah. right now so definitely and we know that you also said that um you were bullied and a lot of you know kids have struggled with that growing up like being bullied and stuff so how did you deal with it back then and then maybe if you were to go back, how would you be like, hey, Ben, like this is how or if you had children like, OK, this is how you should deal with it. Hmm. You sh or did you talk to anyone during that time when you were being bullied or what did that look like? Yeah, that, that was one of the most challenging things about it was <clears throat> I didn't really know up from down. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what was true about me. I didn't know about um you know, all these things that I learned later in life. Yeah. Uh, I, I heard that God loved me and I knew I had a relationship with him, but I thought that I was defined on my good days and my bad days mm -hmm. by my behavior or by my sin. And I, you know, so, so being bullied, being made fun of for my weight, for my faith, the music I was into, uh, my personality. Uh, I, I just kind of, over time started to accept it mm -hmm. as truth yeah. and believed what people were telling me. And so what I wish, um, not wish, uh, but what I, what would have changed that and what I would encourage other people if they're experiencing that to do, or maybe their kids are experiencing that is to, um, to know and to experience in healthy life giving relationships who God says you are. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, th there's so much. And unfortunately, a lot of times, um, I don't think we teach it in the church. A lot of times in the church, we, we focus on our sinnerhood and who we were before Christ. And we don't focus on our sainthood. And, you know, if we're looking at even, you know, yeah, if we're looking at our saint sainthood, if we're looking at Genesis 1 and 2, we're made in the image of God. We have infinite value. Um, we are unique. We are cared about by our our creator. That's why murder is wrong. That's why it's wrong to sin against or hurt one another people because we have this inherent value. Mm -hmm. um, and then even much so more when we give our lives to Christ. When we think about when we think about who we are mm -hmm. um, as people made or in the image of God, you know we've got we've got value. We've got dignity. We're made creative. Uh, creative. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's wrong to murder people, to harm people, to sin against people because we have inherent dignity and, and value and worth. And now in Christ, once we have a relationship with Him, you know the the Bible talks about us being adopted, beloved, uh, forgiven, mm -hmm. 
uh, righteous, in right standing before God. Mm-hmm. And if you think about that long list of things, um, that just kind of gets you hyped up. Like, yeah. that's who, who I am. And thinking about that, but not just intellectually, yeah. if we, but if we experience that in a healthy community, in a healthy family, then when we come up against the um, the harm of this world or, or what people say about us, those are um, these negative experiences, but they, they come up against all these, these truths and these positive experiences we have. And um, that's really one of the, the main things is, is that we change, we change or, or we heal experientially in relationships. We believe truth experientially in relationships yeah. um, by, by not just reading the Bible, but by doing the Bible. Yeah. And that, us like this this competency of of belief and the saturation and truth so that when we come up against those things um it's easy you know to for them to fall right right off of us rather than to take them to heart yeah. mm-hmm. so that i mean that starts at a young age of, of building that into to kids and to our friends and, and whatnot but even if you know like me learning those things later yeah in life it means getting around people who will live that out who will treat you that that way um and help you experience who god says you are i like how you said that because um you know i know people can go from one extreme to the other they can focus on that you're just a sinner you know and and go too hard on that or they could go too much on grace but um from your experience and i think a lot of people they feel like they have worth in what they do, mm. you know, or and so then we start to bring that into Christianity, yeah. and we think, oh, well, God will love me if I do this, you know, or God will love me if I do that, or He won't love me if I do something bad, right? Mm. And so we kind of bring that into Christianity, even though we know the truth, even though we know the answer, um, maybe in our in our minds, just intellectually, but what shows us that we really know it is if we live it right and so i think i think i know that's been a struggle for me you know thinking trying to you know perfectionism and stuff and trying to do everything right and that i we should do that just naturally because we love god not to try to earn god's love and uh yeah what would you say to someone um because i think a lot of people struggle with that they try to they think their good works are going to outweigh their bad, even though they mm-hmm. know Christ, God has already paid for all, for all our, of our sin, right? So what would you say to encourage someone or to, because some people go too far in grace, mm-hmm. but some people go too far in saying you're a sinner. So how do you, how do you keep that balance? What do you do? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, I'm a why guy. So I, me, by that, I mean, I'm a researcher and mm-hmm. I like to know why things happen and, and, and why. And I think we can get, um, we can really find where like healing and where we need to be set free when we start to understand the why. Mm-hmm. So by asking, why do I view God this way? Mm-hmm. See, see, so often our experiences growing up with authority figures yeah. Um, the positive experiences, the negative experiences make it easier or less easy to believe certain things about God as we relate to him because our foundational relationships set the path and the course for our um, other relationships. Uh, I think that's why the Proverbs speak of um, uh, raise a child up, you know, in this way and he will not depart from it. Uh, And that happens for good or for bad. So if we start to ask, hey, why do I struggle to trust God? in this area or to view them this way or to view myself this way. I know in my life and in the past nine years, hundreds of people I've worked with, so much of it comes back to their relationship with their parents, their relationship with teachers, their relationship with their um, friends or older siblings and, and these painful experiences where they were felt like they couldn't measure up or were defined by what they do. And then boom, like that's, that's, you know, a recipe for buying into religion, religion saying that you are what you do and you can earn God's love or you can unearn his love. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons why it can be so hard for us to believe that. But Mm -hmm. to start asking, um, who have I copied and pasted Mm -hmm. onto my view of God? (laughs) That's good. And where do I need 
Yeah, and where do I need God to lovingly heal me and to um, break down those walls and to restore my my view of Him? So that would be one. I think too, um, you know, when Morgan, when you talked about how do we navigate the majoring on our this is what I would say uh, majoring on our sin and talking about that or majoring on grace and who we are. Um, it is flip flop flip flopped depending where I was at in my journey, Mm -hmm. because at, at some, um, at some stages it was like, wow, I'm diving into Leviticus and learning about (laughs) the holiness of God and I'm struggling to make it through it. And it seems so tedious and seems like God is so uptight but then I realized, no, that's he's not uptight. He's just showing how other he is and how holy and how worthy to be praised he is. Mm-hmm. And that could be like this reverence of that. And then on the other um, on the other side, it's it's like I'm learning, wait, that God says this about me and wants to know me and says that I'm, you know, in Christ, like ten feet tall and bulletproof, <laughs> so to speak, mm-hmm. because of him. Um and just trying to figure out how to hold that in in weight of that. But I think if there's a good balance of understanding, um, you know, how the depth of our sin and of our betrayal against God um, and separating that from who we are, like separating the who from the do, mm-hmm. it's so hard to do because we want to – feel good about ourselves when we're killing it and spending hours in prayer Mm -hmm. and getting into our study Bible or serving in church, you know, we can feel good about ourselves. But even that, that's like the flip side of the coin of, um, religion, because that's still identifying ourselves by what we do. Um, so constantly having this awareness of this is who God says I am, Mm -hmm. regardless of my good behavior, my bad behavior, so I try and, at least mentally and with meditation and scripture, constantly go to, um, I never, I, I don't quote scripture to myself about um, sin or uh, who I was or those type of things. I quote scripture to myself about like First John 3, 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to me that I should be called a child of God and so I am. And that's not because I don't take sin seriously. Mm -hmm. It's because I know and experience more and more of who I am as a child of God, then I will want sin less Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because my behavior will line up more and more. I mean, behavior follows beliefs. So if if my beliefs are more and more about what is true and who I am, um, then I'm not going to want that as more. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, in the in the center of my battle with pornography, it was like um, quoting like memorizing scripture about like Job. I will not. I made a covenant to not look at you know a woman lustfully mm-hmm. or, or flirtation. And you know it's great to memorize scripture. Don't get me wrong, but that made me think about it all the wor- yeah. the more. Oh, yeah. So I didn't change what I was doing necessarily. I changed what I was memorizing. So instead, now it's like, oh wait, I'm tempted to do this. Why am I getting tempted? Oh, well, I'm probably feeling rejected. I'm feeling worthless. And then I'm actually taking it deeper and getting to the core rather than just the symptom of what's what's yeah, happening. Yeah, so I was going to say, a lot of times we deal with the symptoms, but not really the real issue and what is causing those things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, sometimes I I think, I don't know, may, you, maybe tell me what you think. But sometimes some people do need to hear, you know, those scriptures like, hey, I'm a sinner because they're just so there's so much pride or they think they can do no wrong. Like I went to a school where um, a lot of the kids thought, hey, I'm a Calvinist. I'm chosen. Nothing can separate me. So they just live like the devil. You know, they took it too far. And so I think sometimes it kind of reminds me of Romans, how it says, Remember both the kindness and severity of God, you know, so for those who obey, you know, you're, you can say, Hey, look, there's kindness. But for, if you disobey, and I know that can get into, you can think of, Oh, now I have to do works now, Mm -hmm. but I'm saying it in the sense 
that God is gracious, you know, to those who who are just humble and know that they broken. need him. Yeah, who are broken and maybe, you know, facing rejection and stuff and maybe that's why they're going to these different things. So they just need to find the love of the Father. But then there's also other people who feel like God they deserve God's love or they like they they're just there's just so much pride and I think sometimes I was reading that verse today that God opposes the proud, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, what do you think about that? Um, do you think there's different times uh, that people need to be looking at certain verses over the others, or should they always just look at the verses of love? Like, what do you think? I think we should read all the Bible <laughs> yep. and be <laughs> very familiar with, uh, um, very familiar with everything mm -hmm. and, you know, exegesis and the Greek words and whatnot. So I, I'm not saying I don't read those. Yeah. I'm just saying what like I quoting it what to I yourself, preach to myself. Right? You're saying, yeah. yeah, yeah. What I what I quote to myself is who I am in Christ and who God says I am, mm -hmm. not who I was. Yeah. You know, because I'm trying to become more and more and live into who who I am. Yeah. Um, but but there are, um, I think, especially before you give your life to Christ, there's a huge need. Um, to come to a, an understanding of of the holiness of God. I mean, this is how, you know, we become a Christian mm -hmm. and, and follow Jesus. We have an awareness of our sin and the devastating effects and the separation and, and what we deserve in God's holiness, but also his love mm -hmm. for us. And then in Christ, um, we never want to forget that. We never want to forget, you know, um, our tendencies or where we came from or, or whatnot. But I think so many of us stay stuck in we live like we still aren't Christians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like we, we live like we're still orphans and not adopted and don't have the Father's love. And we and the evidence of that is all the things we're struggling with and where we get acceptance and trying to perform for our worth and, and whatnot. So um, it's I, I think that if somebody uh, truly can start to get, you know, the Father's love and who they are in Christ, um, that they won't be prideful, that they won't be arrogant yeah. because understanding the source mm -hmm. of that, like it's, it's God yeah, who did it's it. It's that. God who, me this way. it's God who, you know, adopted me. It's God who saved mm -hmm. me. Um, so. Yeah. If they really understood the love of God, then, it wouldn't have to be, it, they wouldn't be prideful because yeah. it's so humbling. You know, yeah. it's it's a gift of God. And it says, you know, so no man may boast, you know. And so, I think that yeah. that was like for me, like I can relate to your story and the fact of I heard you saying like you would like sometimes 20 times a day be praying and like mm. repenting and like, God, am I saved even? And so I grew up struggling with that, you know, being mm -hmm. a PK, always in church, and thinking like, oh my goodness, I am such a sinner and God doesn't love me. And my dad, what he ended up teaching me is it's not an obedience issue as much as it's a love issue. Like at uh, John 14, 15, where it says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And so mm -hmm. if we look at it as like, no, if you obey me, then that should like if we but we need to understand, like if we truly understand how much God loves us, if we truly understand um, what he did for us on the cross, like we'll just humble ourselves when we do sin because it breaks our heart that we're breaking the father's heart because he loves us so much. Yes. And so that's why I love the song, how deep the father's love for us. And because it's so true, like um, what you were saying, so many people compare their relationship with their father and then they bring it to God. Like, Oh, that's mm -hmm. how God is. God, like my, if my dad's very demanding, like that's how God is. Or if my dad just isn't there, God isn't there. And mm -hmm. so like you were saying, we need to have a good view of who God really is. And the only way we can really do that is by, you know, reading the word of God, every verse, seeing that both the kindness and severity of God, that he, you know, didn't come to bring peace, but a sword, but then he's the prince of peace. And it's like, what? It doesn't make sense. But that's the thing. Like he is El Shaddai, you know, many breasted one. He's a mother. He's then a father to the fatherless. And he's all these things that we need, like you said, at different times and seasons of our life but if we just try to put him in a box like god you just do this like no he 
he has all different things and that's a, the Holy Spirit, you know, he's our counselor, our comforter, he convicts us, like all these things. And so um, I would love for you to talk more about your testimony. And mm. I know that you went through a, a difficult season. I think you said your senior year of high school with your grandfather. And then after that's when you mm-hmm. went to college. And um, so could you start from there and share that a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, it was, it was uh, let's see, I was 12 or 13 where I started to have significant doubts mm-hmm. about God's existence. Mm-hmm. Um, I went through, there was a, about a two week period uh, where I was out of school and I had some kind of virus um, that was you know, virus. <laughs> probably like the coronavirus, yeah. coronavirus Swine 2001, flu. you know? Yeah. I wasn't oinking though. <laughs> um, it was some kind of terrible virus. I've never been that sick in my life. And I was having trouble thinking clearly. I was having night sweats, night terrors, wake up in the middle of the night, being convinced that I was going to die. And I just wasn't sleeping well. I was struggling to, you know, think logically. And my brain just started going places like what, what's going to happen if I die? And oh wait. And then I, I started to have doubts, you know, probably for one of the first times, like, is God actually real? And then I started to think, oh, wait, Christians don't doubt if God God is real, so I'm not a Christian. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought every time that I had a doubt, I was no longer a Christian, that I had to pray again to give my life to Christ. Mm-hmm. And that's when the upwards of 20 times a day, uh, it was exhausting. Yeah. Thinking I was a Christian, I was not a Christian, I was a Christian, I was not a Christian. And um, that just led to this this chaos and this confusion And over time, this anger towards God, Mm -hmm. like, why is this happening? Why am I struggling to believe that you're real? Um, And I was involved in ministry in high school and going to youth group and, you know, leading younger teens. Um, But over time, I just, just anger towards God grew. Mm -hmm. And um, on top of that, like my, my, you know, relationships with my family weren't that great and my relationship with my dad and then. Um, it all kind of came crashing down. My was that the end of of my junior year. I was starting to get more and more angry. Junior year of high school, and then found out that my grandfather died by suicide. And I was like, "That's it. I am so over you, God. Um, like you're not preventing these things. I'm struggling with this." don't know where you are. Things aren't getting better. And, uh, that's when I decided, like, I am no longer gonna live, live for him. Mm -hmm. Just kind of do, gonna kind of do my own thing. So I went away to college at George Mason university and, um, just was angry and shut off and isolated. And, um, I never got into drinking and, and partying um, I was part of this, well, there's this underground movement in hardcore punk called the straight edge. And, uh, so, so I was part of that. So my, my release was really just going to shows and I was going to shows and, and moshing and stage diving and, um, got, got really into that and playing in bands and then got like way too many tattoos cause everybody's <laughs> all, you know, yeah. tattooed. Um, but that was really a way of surviving and coping and being part of a community. Um, but I was, I was really hurting and had a lot of unanswered questions and was just dealing with so many doubts about God's existence. And during that time, God put people in my life, uh, at George Mason university, people who were involved in a college ministry called crew there. And they just started reaching out to me, inviting me to things, loving on me. And for one of the first times in my life, I felt truly loved and accepted for who I was. They were, I mean, they were getting after Jesus and they, they treated me the way that Jesus probably would have, despite me being a bad friend and being angry and, and whatnot towards them. And, um, over time, God just used those relationships to, um, have some conversations where people just asked me how I was doing and did I have a relationship with God? And, um, God used that to draw me back to himself. And 
I got to the point where I was just like, this isn't working, you know, running away from God. I know he's real. I have doubts, but Christianity makes the most sense to me. Um, so God, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. And I'm, I'm all in and uh, I believe help my unbelief. Yeah. And I started praying that multiple times a day. You know, it was funny to switch <laughs> rather than praying, you know, for acceptance or, or to give my life to Christ thinking I wasn't a Christian. It was, I believe helped my unbelief. And, uh, over the years, the doubts got better and, um, it, it was, it was awesome, um, you know, to involved in that community and to have those, those experiences of, of feeling loved and accepted and feeling the father's love, feeling that, um, experiencing who I was and really getting into, you know, studying the Bible and theology mm-hmm. and sharing, sharing my faith with others. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I know that you talked about um, you talked about the importance of listening. Mm-hmm. I've, I think I heard you mention Josh something that like that. Too. Yeah. yeah, and so um, <laughs> yeah, what is listening nowadays? Because it seems like we're we're so fast paced. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't even take the time to listen. Yeah. Or when they're listening to you, they're really just um, trying to figure out how to respond to you. Mm-hmm. You know, or how to solve a problem. So. Yeah, what what's the importance of listening to someone, and what does that look like? Because some people think they know what listening is, but they don't really. So, yeah, yeah. what does that look like? I think what you're saying is, <laughs> no, <I'm, laughs> I don't know. I wasn't yeah. listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you repeat that? <laughs> um, I yeah. Throughout the years, I've. There's nothing worse than talking to somebody who sucks at listening. <laughs> Can I say that? Yeah. Um, who is terrible at listening. Like they're talking and they're, I mean, you're talking and they're like looking over behind mm-hmm. you and over there and wondering what else is happening. That, that is such, I would say that that's such a way of downplaying the image of mm-hmm. God. That's true. Like we're made in the image of God. We have value. God cares about us. His eyes on the sparrow. He we don't deserve it, but now, you know, he's giving us attention and looking at us and caring for us. What a way that we can show that and honor other people by doing that Mm -hmm. and help them experience, you know, who God says they are. Mm -hmm. I digress. But um, (laughs) when it comes to listening, uh, I think there's things that that I've picked up on over the years that I've tried to implement that help people to feel valuable. Mm -hmm. And this can be especially important if there's somebody that we want to know Jesus, that we want to, you know, experience the Father's love, um, and we want to share the the gospel, the message of Jesus with them. If we're not giving, like, honoring them and showing them that we're listening, um, they're probably not going to receive it yeah. from us. Mm-hmm. So there's things like, you know, uh, asking questions, mm-hmm. you know, about so many different things, asking why questions, asking, tell me more mm-hmm. about that, you know. Mm-hmm things like that. And then making eye contact and using facial um, expressions. Like if they're sad, you know, the Bible says they mourn with those who mourn. Be sad with them. Um, If they are happy, be happy with them. Mm -hmm. Um, But to make that eye contact, to smile, to nod, to frown, to (laughs) nod, uh, show that you're really there. And then one thing that's really hard is is to not be thinking about, you know, like you said, Morgan, not be thinking about what you're going to say next yeah yeah. just thinking about and empathizing with them and then um it's really powerful if in those moments you're you're asking god asking the holy spirit to to help you because this is a divine a divine appointment a divine moment god's sovereign there's a reason we're talking right now whoever it is (laughs) the person that walks into the grocery store one of your family members you know whatever there's a reason of all the things that could be happening right now, there's a reason why God wants this interaction to be happening. Yeah. Um, what does God want me to do? What does God want me to say? What does God want me to ask? Mm-hmm. And um, I found that to be really powerful, especially running into people who don't know Jesus and just the the conversations that, that can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's always, it's hard to have that mentality because we we're so busy, mm-hmm. you know, busy, even though, time hasn't changed we've all had you know 24 hours a day for yeah it seems like 
Uh, we just want to come with the message, you know, and we're like, oh, yeah, I just got to get this message out real quick. Here's the answer. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the answer. See ya. Yeah. And instead of really listening. And I, I understand some people are like, well, you know, sometimes even my dad's been like that at times. He's like, you know, I know he's like, I know I need to listen better. But he's like, sometimes it's hard sometimes when you you already feel like you know the answer. Yeah. And so we have to have that self-control mm. to say, you know, even though I've heard this a similar story same like this, story. yeah, same old story. There's nothing really new under the sun. People go through the same struggles. But yeah, it's really important for people to, you know, hear you and, you know, not hear you. I mean, to be listened to and then they're able to accept what you have to say, you know, yeah. and you know, some people just want to talk and then they don't listen to the gospel or listen to the truth that you have to bring them. Um, and so you, you still have to be, you have, still have to know how to work that in. But yeah, it's, it's so, it's so hard in the, you know, I think we make ourselves more busy, even though you said mm -hmm. we have the same amount of time, right? But we make ourselves more busy. So we feel like we have to just throw out tracks and everything. And there's <laughs> nothing wrong with those things that can, plant a seed yeah. but that that might not stick if you know someone's doesn't show like you said the love of god by li listening or show a characteristic of god because you don't see that nowadays and i think another thing is i was thinking about like when you're talking about eye contact and things and mm. i can't even look at the right camera so <laughs> i'm like yeah i'm like <laughs> it's it's hard nowadays that we because we're we're always behind screens like we are yeah. now right I know COVID and stuff, it's it's different. But still, you know, it, it's harder for us to to know how to have these relationships, you know, face to face. Everything's through texting, mm -hmm. emails, um, even like this. This isn't technically face to face. At least I can see your face and it's a little better because I see your expression. But, you know, it's I think we're kind of losing that um, through connection. technology. Yeah, that connection. Yeah. yeah, and we know that, like, you have talked about that, too. Like, so many people, like, what you struggled with was loneliness. Like, I feel lonely, I feel rejected, mm. and it's not just because, oh, we need more friends. It's, like, the people that are there, we truly need that connection. Like, be, like being able to talk and ask the tough questions. Like, I, in your story, I was when we were listening to it, you were saying how your friend, he asked you, like, he either said, how is your relationship with God, or do you have a relationship and just like that, whether you want to call it or like a, just a word that pierced your heart or something, a word of knowledge or whatever you want to say it was. But either way, it reminds me of like the woman at the well, like when Jesus went to her and he didn't have to, you know, he she was a Samaritan. She was a woman. But he said just the word like, that's right. You haven't had a, like you have five husbands. The one you're the man you're with is not your husband. And hmm. so that word convicted her. And that's what mm -hmm. it did to you. Like it stirred your heart like, oh my goodness, like I don't really have a relationship with God. And I think that's um, what we're realizing um, just being in ministry with like young kids and stuff that it's really important to be able to just like let them cry, like listen to them. Because my dad, he is the best listener. I'm literally a daddy's girl because he'll just, you know, listen to me vent and like cry and stuff. And then I'll end up answering like the thing I was asking him, like, in, in me just talking through it, I'll end up like answering like, oh, okay, this is the problem. But so many times we're like, we have the right verse or we have the right answer instead of just being able to like Holy Spirit, like you said, mm -hmm. speak to them, convict them, um, touch their heart and give me the right word that you want me to say. Mm -hmm. And so I think what it really comes down to is patience, self-control, like time, being able to really care about that person because Jesus did that with the woman at the well. So um, for you, I would like for you to even share about that, um, just having that connection with that group you had um, and then, you know, accountability, how important that is too hmm. and how important it is to have that connection with brothers and sisters in Christ and what that looked like for you, even possibly what it looked like for you getting out of pornography and what, was that what helped you or when did that like start or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can share that. Sorry. I kind of went along with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I love to say that loneliness is not a lack of friends. It's a lack of meaningful connection. Yeah. <clears throat> That's why people can be alone in a crowd yeah. or they can be 
this generation, you know, it's been said that they are more connected than ever than lo- uh, more connected than ever yet lonelier than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and God designed us to have deep, meaningful connection and conversations with him and others. What does that mean? It means talking about our fears, our feelings, and our dreams, not just the weather <laughs> or our favorite menu item at Taco Bell for those of us who still eat Taco Bell. Um, but, uh, that leads to this. It, it, it also does things in our brain. It releases, um, oxytocin, which is a bonding agent. It releases dopamine. It causes us to feel good and connected and understood. Mm-hmm. Um, pornography releases some of those same chemicals. Um, and so many people get a, in their loneliness will get addicted to pornography, but God designed us to have something better, yeah. something more meaningful and lasting. And that's the healthy relationships, the meaningful connection. So that was a big part of my my healing journey. I would say it was one of the key pieces. Um, having a group of a couple other guys who um, all throughout the week, we would text one another, we would call one another, mm-hmm. and we wouldn't, and we would talk about, you know, way before the moment of temptation happens. There's all of these other things happening. Yeah. We say that un- unmet longings lead to unwanted behaviors. Mm-hmm. So these un or otherwise said unmet desires lead to unhealthy patterns. So there's desires going on. There's there's these foundational desires that God created us to have in the Garden of Eden, like acceptance, safety, love, attention, to be known, understood. Mm-hmm. So any variance in those throughout our day, any lack of those, any rejection of those um, is going to cause this unmet longing. Mm -hmm. And then what do we do with that? You know, as we learn, as we mature spiritually and emotionally and relationally, we learn to deal with those unmet desires and those unmet longings, take them to God to process with him and to go to other people. So that's what we ended up doing. Most of our phone calls ended up not being about, Hey, I just looked at pornography or I just did this. It was, Hey, I'm feeling really anxious about this conversation. I'm feeling missed by this person. I'm feeling stressed because of this Mm -hmm. and listening to one another, encouraging and affirming one another. What did that do? That got rid of the unmet longing or the unmet desire. Well, filled it with in a godly way. And then making phone calls with one another became um, the new addiction, so to speak, yeah. but, but a health yeah. or the new pattern, new healthy thing. So I've been doing that for nine years. So now my gut instinct, um, I can't remember the last time I've been free from porn for six years and I can't That's remember the last time that I was tempted to look at it. What happens now, my, because, you know, Romans twelve two says, be transformed by the renewing mm-hmm. of your mind neuroplasticity shows that our brains can be rewired Mm -hmm. old pathways. uh, It's like muscle memory, old pathways that were developed can be undeveloped as new ones are built. Mm -hmm. And um, as we live into the healthy ways that God has designed us to live. So, I mean, it's like that, that helped heal the loneliness that helped me overcome pornography. um, That's helped so much with the anxiety and the depression just that one thing. And of course there's other things that I'm, I think are are super helpful, like therapy and trauma therapy and working through some of the deep rooted Mm -hmm. issues. But, um, at minimum we need people, we need one another. I think that's what God says. He says to, yeah, to not forsake the fellowship of believers. And, um, and I, I see people, you know, we've been dealing with this, uh, with different people, um, there's been people who kind of jump from church to church. And in a sense, when you first think of it, you're like, hey, yeah, we're we're all the body of Christ. You know, yeah. you can go to different churches and stuff. But what I see is missing there or what we seem to do, our generation, we we kind of like to jump from church to church to, to not miss out on anything. FOMO. Yeah, to kind of stay connected and stuff, which is which you could say, hey, that's go good in a sense. Yeah. yeah. But um, what do you think the importance of like a group of believers or like a, ch- a church? Because what I've seen is, you know, people kind of jump from church to church. And then, you know, if one church says something convicting or, you know, if there if something happens, you know, and there's accountability, you know, try, someone's trying to hold them accountable 
then they just kind of run. They just go to the next church. So what's the importance of really staying with a group of people, like you said, or a church? So what do you think about that? Yeah, I throughout the years, I've taken really seriously why I, if I switch, you know, I'm big on church membership, but why, why I would switch yeah. being at a church? Mm-hmm. Um, because you know, I, I've, I've witnessed that. And also I've witnessed how hard it is when other people do that. I'm like, mm-hmm. guys, I just got plugged yeah. in. I met all these yeah. people. You guys are really all yeah. leaving yeah. and going to that church. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's frustrating and it's hard and it's, um, but maybe sometimes I've over spiritualized it, mm-hmm. but I kind of think like, okay, I generally agree with the ecclesiology and the theology. I've built relationships with here. Um, there's no perfect church. Mm-hmm. You know, if, mm-hmm. if there was, and I went there, it would no longer be <laughs> yeah. perfect. And, um, but so unless something drastic happens, which is, or and God makes it yeah. clear, mm-hmm. um, then then I'm gonna be here. And perhaps if there's things I don't like about it, perhaps that's why yeah. I'm there mm-hmm. because God wants to use me. Um, so I think if we had more of a mentality of giving rather than yeah. getting, yeah. Um, that would really really serve us as it goes to um, churches. And then also thinking about who's going to be affected mm-hmm. if I leave. Hopefully somebody's going to yeah. be affected because mm-hmm. otherwise that means that I wasn't really, you know involved in involved in relationships and, mm-hmm. and and making a difference here um but to really really think ab- about that and um but of course if there's if you're moving or if um there's certain moral yeah. issues or mm-hmm. i don't know what it is Why do you I, think, I think it's always good to like for since you probably work with uh gen z and, mm-hmm. and stuff more than us yeah. um why do you think it's so hard for us now to make commitments? It seemed like it was mm. easier or maybe not easier, but it was, um, you know, it was more encouraged back, back in the day, you know, back when our grandparents are like, yeah, we used to be committed. Yeah. We're going to war. But yeah. yeah. So why do you think it's so much harder or I don't know the correct term, but you hopefully, you know, what I'm trying to get at. Why is it so hard for our young generation and you know my generation to to be committed to things we have trust issues <laughs> well you know it's it's like if you go to the grocery store and you've got a hundred options of a pint of <laughs> ice cream as opposed to just five yeah. you know the decision's going to be a lot sure. harder um i think this generation and part of my generation grew up with just um so many options yeah. there's mm paralysis and yeah. you know to choose i think it's a latin word the root of that means to cut off mm. so if i choose and cut off that then oh no fomo sets in and we are discipled by the world to constantly have um all of these options mm. and you know you think about smartphones and apps it's it's like everything's at our fingertips mm. and amazon and all these different choices so we um i, I think our our grow up and hardwired even in our brains to all these different options and choices and um, constantly being in that state of endless options. So to choose to really give our lives to something, our time to something that's going to take that up, that's, that can be such an anxiety producing Mm -hmm. thing because it, to choose means to cut off, like I said, so it really means okay, if I go with this and I'm not getting this, um, which is, which is a, a troubling mindset Mm -hmm. that, that we've got into in, in, you know, our, our day and age. And then I like how you said that because so many times when you have too many options, like, could it be this? And like, even people freak out with that with like finding people. And I think that's why a lot of young people go to different church and church hop because they're trying to find a spouse. Like, is he here? Is he there? Is he mm-hmm. instead of just trusting? And like you said, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. Give me faith that as I keep abiding in you, that you will bring that person to me as I'm faithfully serving. And then, you know, people think, oh, like all these young kids, they just want love. So that's the thing why they're dating. They're doing all this stuff. They're looking at pornography and trying to get 
the love in all the wrong places and music and all these things instead of really, like you said, connection with people. And I like how you said it too. Um, I think you and Josh were saying this where um, you're saying like where the church doesn't speak about things, you know, if they don't talk about sex, if they don't explain like biblically what it looks like in marriage, if they don't explain and like let kids like being able to talk about these things and letting the schools teach them, then that's where Satan gets in and starts like where there's, you know, silence that's where satan gets in and Mm. so um the verse that we always tell people that's so freeing and it was freeing for me to confess my sins because i thought oh god i'm getting right with you i was like why do i always feel like i'm not saved and i knew it was because i had a sin in my life that i was like i'm gonna take this to the grave i'm not telling anyone i've ever done this and i Mm. remember you guys were talking about this but james 5 16 was what had convicted me like i need to talk to my dad Because he does listen, he does care, and he's not going to judge me. He's not going to put me down. So it was James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So I would like for you to, you know, talk about that, how important it is to confess your sin, obviously get right with God, but why it's so important to just get it out, like, in the open. And, yeah, people can judge you. They think, oh, you're so gross and I can't believe you struggle with that. But like 10 times out of 10, they probably have something that they're hiding. And so um, can you share how important that is for the church even to be able to get involved, for parents to be able to be that listening ear where their kids don't have to feel judged or condemned if they share, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm thinking about this or, you know, I'm tempting with this or I'm having these feelings or desires. So what do I do? And so how would you say the church and parents should better respond to their children? Yeah, I I think, well, that verse is so powerful and such a powerful principle because um, sin, when kept secret, eats us alive. And there are so many lies we believe about ourselves, about others, about it it just, uh, it just breeds, but it dissipates when it's brought to the light. Of Mm -hmm. course, you know, to God, but there's something powerful when we have this fear that we're going to be judged and condemned, even though God Almighty has already forgiven us for it and doesn't judge Mm -hmm. us and doesn't condemn us. We have a fear of his people that they will do Mm -hmm. the same. And maybe because that's happened Mm -hmm. in the past or whatever. But when we get around safe people and we start committing to a life of no secrets, and I think every leader needs at least two people who they have a life of no secrets with, they share even their, the worst thoughts they've yeah. ever had, you know, that is shared and they're met with love and acceptance and, and grace and reminded of who God says they are. That does something that eliminates um, fear and, and shame that the enemy doesn't have a playground yeah. a- anymore because they, they literally get to experience um, God's love, uh, Jesus' forgiveness through other people and it, it almost it, it does something that that helps us believe it and experience it on a on a deeper level mm-hmm. um and it's it just it's so it's so relieving yeah. um because there you know secret sin just eats us alive and consumes so much of our thoughts and our worries and it's um especially i mean yeah, as a christian with the holy spirit it's like uh, it's like trying to live a double yeah. life and mm-hmm. it it eats you alive it's exhausting. Um, <laughs> it is. yeah yeah, so exhausting. Mm. Um, but I, I think as hard as it is, um, if what we can do is start creating safe yeah. environments where um, people are, our behaviors, our behaviors towards them back up um, what we say. So if we say we love somebody, do we actually mm-hmm. love them? Do we sacrifice for them? Do we provide for them? Do we protect them? Or do we just say that? Uh, do we accept them or do we, do they share stuff about their interests and we, they constantly see us like, Oh, that's weird or frown upon them or, Oh, that's lame. You know, are we creating a safe environment um, means that we are showing God's love and acceptance and interest uh, in people for who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course in that environment, you know, you, you want to talk about truth and the Bible and our need for, forgiveness. Um, but all those things set the stage for the safe environment where um, people can, you know, confess their sins to one another 
and be Amen. healed because it's so healing mm-hmm. in that safe environment when when we do yeah. that. That's so true. Well, we know we are past the time, but um, mm-hmm. I know Morgan still needs to ask that question really quick. But also, um, just for statistics, I love how Josh was just sharing that it's so important for parents to really do their job and not just think, oh, I need to tell them, do as I say, not as I do. And, but truly, I think you were talking about this too, Gen Z people, they, they want truth, but they see so much hypocrisy in their parents or leaders or like how even for you, like you were struggling with like while you were leading, still struggling with pornography and that guilt and shame and trying to hide it and appear perfect to these kids and stuff and not get help. How much like Satan constantly is like condemning you and saying, who, who are you to say this? Or like Proverbs 28, 1, where it says, the righteous, when you're in right standing with God, are as bold as a lion. And that's where we get our peace. Not because we're perfect, but we're constantly humbling ourselves. And I think that's so important for parents out there to know that you don't have to be a perfect parent, but like what my parents did is they were just honest with us. Whenever they messed mm. up, whenever they got angry, they said they're sorry. And how powerful that is in a child when you're able to humble yourself and let them know, hey, I didn't do this right. Or even share about your past things like, hey, me and mom struggled with this. So we're encouraging you so you can learn from our mistakes. So just that humble and broken spirit, how much that really does bless the younger generation and they're looking for that. So um, I know Morgan is going to ask his question, but anything else you would like to share maybe about that or anything else you would like to share with your story or anything, any wise words for our listeners today? Hmm. Well, I would say um, uh, there's so many things, hmm. but I think I think one of the the main things that I've continued to come back to is that <clears throat> um, I think it's Romans two that talks about it's his kindness that yes. leads us to hmm. repentance, and um, kindness is different from niceness. Yeah. Uh, but but if we can embody kindness and curiosity and care for people and even for ourselves if we're stuck in something and then repent means to literally to change your mind, to turn around. Mm -hmm. Um, It's God's kindness as we see his love for us, his care for us um, and and trying to get his eyes on us in our situation that will cause us to be wooed by him and to, to turn around and to, to want to give up some of the things we're struggling with because whether or not we realize it, so many of our struggles are actually ways that we've learned to survive and make sense of this broken world Mm -hmm. we live in. And we're going to them for something. There's something that we think we're getting from it, but God wants us to release our hands from that and to get what we're trying to get in unhealthy ways, you know, uh, understand why we're going to something, Mm -hmm. you know, the the unhealthy things we're going to, what we're actually looking for in those things. Well, like and, pornography, uh, right? Understand that that's you're you're going mm-hmm. to that. So, what? Why were you going to pornography? What were you expecting to get, and what did you get instead? So, mm-hmm. maybe you can share about that. Yeah, yeah, like going to it to try and get attention mm-hmm. or love or, or some kind of pursual. Um, and we have to really ask why, because some of these mm-hmm. things are subconscious. But I could only let go of that sin and loosen the grips on it as I saw the kindness of God and how he wanted to provide that for me and design me to have that in relationship with him and others, that attention, that love, and that acceptance. Mm -hmm. And um, once we understand the why, uh, we can start to understand what we're actually looking for Mm -hmm. and how God has designed us to to experience that fulfilled. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And then I know I said, I was like, statistically and i didn't say any stats <laughs> but like josh was saying that um kids are starting to like i think he was saying kids are even starting at, like as young as like five and six six like being exposed to pornography and then globally being addicted by age eight and so this is why we're sharing this right now not to you know just bring something up that's like oh we don't talk about this in church but it's actually going on like mm-hmm. your children are being exposed to this and to just pretend like oh this isn't going on like let's just brush it aside like that is scary like that's why we need to be able to speak up and share like you know that sex is beautiful in marriage but outside of it it, it's dangerous and like even 
Um, I love the verse, Second Timothy, I always say it, Second Timothy 2.22, but flee or run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. And it talks about instead pursue righteous living, um, holiness, and then enjoy the companionship like you were talking about. Um, enjoy the companionship with those who call on the Lord of pure heart. So mm. that's why um, it is important to be able to, when your children are young, to be able to talk to them, to be able to um, help just them to feel free, safe environment where they can. And the same thing with leaders, because some kids we know don't have good parents, but we can be there for them and say like, hey, how are you doing? Like what's going on? Maybe hold them accountable or really just let them. Yeah, I love how you said that. I'm going to take that. Ask the why questions because that's what Jesus did, right? He mm -hmm. always asked questions. And so I love that. It reminds me of, you know, of searching our hearts, you know, asking yeah. the Holy Spirit to yeah. search our hearts because sometimes when we ask ourselves why, it takes us a long time to figure out because uh, we're not that wise sometimes. There's a lot of things. You know? And and there's a and we keep there might be like layers of symptoms yeah. that we're like oh it's this but it turns out that's still just a symptom Not and so way. that's why we need to do the Psalm 139 and ask ask God to search our hearts Amen. and then He can tell us the why the Holy Spirit can tell us so Amen yeah. All right so <laughs> last thing is I would like for you to share you know how maybe even you met Josh McDowell now you are you are part of Crew Ministries which he's a part of. So did you meet him from there and then share what you're doing now? We know you're doing Resolution Movement, but where they can find you and your website. So all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Josh and I met, um, I don't know, five years ago at a big crew conference. And then a year later when he was doing the Set Free Summit, um, it was this global summit to raise awareness about uh, pornography mm -hmm. and its harmful effects. And then um, I reached out to him and asked if we could, if I could come work with him and he'd mentor me and we could do something together to reach people. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So I packed up everything in Virginia and drove to Texas. I'd only been to Dallas once before um, and moved out here three years ago. And um, what's come of that is, is the resolution movement. Yeah. Uh, you can check us out at resolutionmovement.org on there. It's awesome. We've got uh, a podcast, and that's also on you know all the App Store and Spotify and iTunes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But a podcast, season one of the podcast is up. We've got libraries on there with a ton of articles and videos, YouTube videos um, on many many different topics like mental health, sexual wholeness, leadership, parenting, and then uh, we're on social media channels: Instagram, TikTok and Facebook and YouTube at Resolution Movement. Okay. Um, and and we're, we're very active in there. So we love responding to people's questions and, um, you know, asking them how we can serve them, how we can pray for them, mm -hmm. what they need help with. Like that's, that's my full-time ministry yeah. or my full-time job, Amen. that ministry, you know, the Resolution Movement. So. And I love that you said that you reached out to Josh. And for those people out there like, well, no one's come to me and said, like, how are you doing? And I want to hmm. disciple you or mentor you. But sometimes we have to be bold, like, I need help. Yeah. And the friendly have friends, right? And go out to people and step out in boldness, say, hey, could you help me? Like, do you would you mentor me or disciple me? And, you know, that's the fear of being rejected. You always yeah. have that. But it's good to be able to step out in faith mm -hmm. and to have that boldness and, like, and so I love that you did that with Josh and we're so thankful for all that you guys do. And um, you went to college, right, for digital media and all that stuff. So, right? Yeah. Graphic, graphic design. design. So yep. all your stuff is well done. We're <laughs> still learning. We need a lot of <laughs> help. But um, we're so thankful for you. And would you like to pray for us before we end? Yeah, Thank I'd you. love to. Yeah, thankful for y'all too. Oh, Father, uh, thanks so much for, for loving us, for, for um, coming to restore a relationship with you. Thanks that we can have that by um, understanding your love from for us, for by turning from our wrongs and by um, receiving your free gift, uh, forgiveness of love, a relationship with you. Um, so God, would you just continue to bless um, those that, that are listening, help them in their hurts and their struggles. God, would you reveal the why to them, reveal the areas of their lives that you want to bring healing and freedom to um, so that you might use Amen. that 
God, you, you, you never stop with us. You always want to use us mm-hmm. to help other people, to help them know you, to help them experience freedom. Um, so God, would you do that? And God, would you just continue to, to bless uh, Morgan and Mariah? Would you, you help them to, to serve people through this podcast? Um, God, would you just um, stir up hearts, bring encouragement, bring uh, light in this dark and challenging time. God, would you be at work in it through it? Thanks so much for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And we have a bonus question. Uh, you know, all the audience, they want to know how many tattoos you have. <laughs> 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 well, I, I lost track at 49. Wow. wow. 49. Uh, yeah, 49. When but was your I first one? Arms, how old my, were you? leg. Uh, 18? No, 19. 19, yeah. Wow. 19 was the first well, you're one. You're running out of canvas oh. now, huh? <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, yeah, I am. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you'd like to listen to us wherever you get your podcasts, just type in Calvary Conversations. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thanks so much and God bless.